I was on a Sunday morning. I was sitting in the uh, kitchen at the table reading the Sunday paper. And one of the kids said, look at that, you know. Uh, you know, you can see it, I mean, the big explosion or eruption, whatever you care to call it. And I turned on the TV and uh, I'm showing all this stuff coming down the cowlitz. I mean, all you know, logs, I mean, just massive amount of logs. And so I thought, you know, maybe I better head down that way and take a look and see what's going on. So I drove down to Rainier because it's directly across from the mouth of the Cowlitz. And I can see all this stuff coming down. And we might have a problem. May 21st, four days after the explosion, a shaken President Carter promises federal help and then tours the devastation. I've never seen or heard of anything like this before. Somebody said it looked like a moonscape, mm -hmm. but the moon looks like a golf course compared to uh, <laughs> compared to what's up there. This, it is a horrible looking sight. And right there by the Longview Bridge, there was only 13 feet of water left there. So the ships couldn't get through. So we had to get down there right away as soon as possible and start dredging so we could clear out away for the, the ships. And we had the hopper dredges and everything come down to help clear it out. So we just kind of pumped all the material to one side, just enough for the ships to get through. So we did that. Seems to me like within a couple of weeks we had it clear enough that the ships could get through. And then after we got the ships going through, then we started pumping all the material on the beach over there by Rainier. So now Rainier's got a nice beach. It will be at least a month before dredges can clear the volcano mud in the Columbia and completely open this channel again. The port of Portland alone has lost millions of dollars because of the slowdown. The ash is the most abrasive sand in the world, as far as I know of. Used to be Columbia River sand was one of the most abrasives. So consequently, it would wear your pipe out. It's funny how you can, you can pick that material up and you can run it through your fingers, and it, it, it just feels like powder. But you actually put it with water and rub your fingers together, and it's just super abrasive. Because it's like glass is what it is, just a, like a molten glass powder. When you go to dredge it, the cutter would just bang on the top of it. It was like a, a hard shell on the top. And once you broke through it, you know, you, you could dredge. But until, that, until you broke through that crust, uh, you, you know, you couldn't do anything. You'd just sit there and bang the cutter back and forth, you know, up and down. The production was way down, and the expense of the dredge was way up because of it. Yeah, we just uh, worked seven days a week, 24 hours a day, it seemed like. It just uh, tons of that stuff came down the river, you know, and they had to, and it's real abrasive, so when they were dredging it, it just wore out the booster booster pipe, a lot, you know, the pipeline, pump, propellers, everything, so just work, working a lot of hours trying to keep, keep everything going. So everybody, you know, basically worked together, you know, that's what it's all about. When all was said and done, the crews of the Dredge Oregon and other dredging vessels had removed more than 76.5 million cubic yards of material out of the Columbia, Cowlitz, and Tootle rivers, enough to cover a football field to a height of nearly seven miles. The Dredge Oregon alone pumped more than any other dredge involved in the cleanup. To this day, volcanic material still flows from Mount St. Helens into the Cowlitz and Columbia rivers and navigation dredging is ongoing. Thanks to the hard work of the crew of the Dredge Oregon, ships continue to have safe passage up and down the Columbia, and Northwest businesses have access to markets around the globe. <laughs>